So hello everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Culture Heritage, INTAC, and the INTAC Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Kathleen Munro, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director ICID. Now to introduce our speaker. Kathleen Munro joined Caring for Textiles in 2014. After earning a BA in design and museum from Central Michigan, sorry, from Central Michigan University. She received an MFA in costume design and technology from University of Cincinnati, CCM. In the summers, she's a costume maker for the Santa Fe Opera. Kathleen specializes in historic clothing conservation. In her spare time, she enjoys researching and sewing period costumes and accessories using historical hand sewing, sewing techniques, especially 18th century ones. The title for today's talk is Burnout, a studies in conserving printed textiles. The chemistry of 18th and 19th century printed textiles. Um, may I please request all of you to please mute your microphones. Thank you. Well, the title for today's talk is Burnout, Case Studies in Conserving Printed Textiles. The chemistry of 18th and 19th century printed textiles are toward the force of chemical engineering, combined natural dyes with strong modems, and made for splendid textiles and 200 years later, a predictable pattern of damage. Referred to in conservation as the problem of inherent wise, often the modems used to secure and brighten the red, brown, black, and blue dyes have metallic ores that have oxidized and corroded the fibers over time, resulting in a very specific burnout pattern. This presentation will use several high-profile printed textiles, including Martha Washington's bodies and banyan, and several never-seen Indian printed cloth quilts belonging to a major museum. The common problems and solutions for analyzing and conserving 18th and 19th century printed textiles will be reviewed and critiqued. An examination of previous repair methods informs today's practices. These textiles pose continued challenge, challenges in trying to strike the balance of treatment of less is more while addressing large losses and continued degradation. Before I invite Caitlin, may I please again request all of you to mute your microphones. Please type in your questions in the chat box. Uh, we'll be taking those up at the end of the talk. And also type in your name, organization name, and email ID. Now I request Kathleen to please begin her presentation. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me speak today. This presentation was given at Colonial Williamsburg's annual conference symposium in 2017, Printed Fashions, Textiles for Clothing, and the Home. I'm happy that it has a life beyond the conference and I'm getting to share with you today. Over the years, Caring for Textiles has treated and examined many printed textiles, including some high profile and famously owned pieces that we will share with you. Conservators have always dealt with a variety of problems when treated, treating printed textiles, from inherent vice and dye burnout from metal mordants to thin cotton from wear or splitting along pattern and dye lines. In these five case studies, we look at this inherent vice of burnout, as well as previous attempts to conserve, repair, and preserve. And we will look to the future for further conservation treatment options. The burnout or primary inherent vice of many old printed textiles often happens because of the use of iron tannate dyes to achieve dark rich colors. Tannins are inherently very acidic due to phenolic hydroxyl and carboxyl groups in their chemical structures. On top of this, the sulfate ions originating from the iron mordants form sulfuric acid with environmental humidity. The acidity of the dyes and the printing process can cause accelerated breakdown of cellulose fibers, which is why we often see these patterns of loss 
along dark design and pattern lines in these printed textiles. There is currently no method used by the textile conservation community to slow the burnout or prevent it from happening in the future. We can only use methods to stabilize and secure damaged areas. The first among these case studies is a John Hewson textile that Caring for Textiles treated in 2010. A young private client brought it to us in the studio and was very excited to care for her heirloom piece as she is a descendant of the maker himself, John Hewson. He was a prolific American textile artist during the late 18th century, born in London and trained in a cotton printing factory. He moved to the United States and set up a calico printing company of his own in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This piece is related to other John Houston textiles in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and was the same central motif of a quilt that was on display in the Colonial Williamsburg exhibit printed textiles that was put on in conjunction with this conf the conference that I presented at. So the client was very, is very happy to have a piece of her own. Um, in pursuit of good treatment protocol and with a piece of this historic importance, we reviewed other conservation treatments of John Houston textiles, as well as similar and notable prints, printed textiles from this period, including a treatment performed by Sarah Ryder on an Omara bed cover at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It came into the studio previously framed and in need of treatment. Upon unframing, it was discovered that the textile was adhered in each corner to an extremely acidic backing board. Luckily, it was safely, though painstakingly, removed. It did, though it did not have any complete areas of burnout, some of the black and brown elements of the design are very brittle and showed slight amount of powdering. This because of this and other color testing for dye fastness, it was determined that the textile could not safely be wet cleaned without further loss to the black and brown areas. Though it would have been a great benefit for the textile to be deacidified. The textile was instead surface cleaned with latex free polyurethane foam sponges in the areas of cream ground, which did manage to um, remove a considerable amount of surface soiling. About 10 areas along the bottom of the textile were damaged due to wear and were repaired using fine cotton thread and careful hand stitching. An archival amount was prepared and the textile was cautiously secured. With treatment and a new mount, our client can now enjoy her cherished family heirloom for years to come. The second treasured textile that Caring for Textiles treated came into the studio from a private client in 2014. A large and commanding piece at five feet by six feet, our client was interested in getting this beautiful quilted kalamkari conserved and mounted for frame display in their home. Little is known about this piece's specific origin, though it was most likely made in India. The face is one large hand-painted panel of fine cotton with a piece border. The backing fabric has a cream ground and small repeated pattern of red bunches of tulips, most likely block printed. On first appearance, the Kalamkari looked to be in remarkable condition, but on closer inspection, the stunning patterns that make up the face of the textile disguise many areas of wear and loss scattered throughout the piece. This graphic shows all the areas that were treated. In order to be prepared for display, the main stabilization treatment focused on the protection and encapsulation of the damaged, split, and torn hold areas on the face of the textile. 
The technique used to preserve these areas was the application of sheer beige polyester netting and a dyed shade close to the color tones of the textile. Because of the sheer quality of the netting, it will only minimally mask the clarity of the patterns. It is not noticeable from a distance and will effectively support the damages. This netting was attached by hand with fine backstitching and Scala monofilament polyester thread in 15 areas of the Kalampari. In many of these areas, the application, we were able to use lines of the quilting pattern to further disguise our treatments in areas of netting. 44 areas throughout the pieces, piece did not require such encompassing treatment, but were carefully repaired using fine hand stitching and scala thread to draw splits and tears back together. After treatment, it was stable enough to be mounted for display. In 2013, Caring for Textiles conserved and prepared this bodice worn by Martha Washington for display at Mount Vernon. It is dated to the late 18th century and made from cream colored cotton with a brown and pink printed pattern and lined with plain cream colored linen. There were many areas of damage throughout which required stabilization, especially along the vertical brown stripes. The bodice shows very typical splitting along printed pattern lines. Here you can see the print in detail. We were charmed by the topography-like pattern. You really don't notice it from far away, but it is interesting to see this print both at a distance and close up. This is an example of the type of damage seen throughout the bodice, long vertical splits along the brown stripes, opening to show the linen lining beneath. All areas of damage were stabilized using overlays of fine monofilament nylon net. The sheer net allows for visibility of the printed fabric, fabric below and will protect all the damaged areas from developing over time. Part of the treatment was mounting on a customized mannequin for display. Mounting a fragile printed textile can be very challenging. The wrong tug, no matter how gentle, can potentially create new splits in weak areas that are not visible to the eye. In the collection at Tudor Place Historic House and Gardens in Washington, D.C., there is a banyan that also belonged to Martha Washington. And as far as we currently know, it is still in need of treatment. Caring for Textiles examined this banyan in 2008 and was tasked with preparing a conservation assessment treatment proposal for creating a reproduction. It is dated to 1780s or 90s. It is made from a soft and fine printed cotton with a motif of red flowers within scalloped circles. The banyan has scattered areas of historical repair and cotton is very worn in certain areas. The banyan was clearly a garment that was very well used and loved. There are scattered stains and foxing throughout. It also, of course, has many damages due to the burnout in, of the print areas and some areas of complete loss where the print is missing. It is unknown whether or not this printed cotton was imported from India, but it is visually similar to other floral motifs produced there for English and American market. And here we have a very clear example of burnout. You can see where the areas of print have dissolved away, leaving the rest of the cotton intact. Some areas of the banyan have more significant loss than others. You can see in the photography where new areas are beginning to develop and other areas have already been fully lost. Here is an example of a previous repair seen in the banyan. It was completed at an unknown date 
But due to the darning technique, we can imagine that it was likely done while the garment was still in use. As far as we know, the banyan has still not been treated, but we do hope it may be in the future. This lovely jacket dated to the 1790s was graciously loaned to us by Mary During, a notable collector of 18th century costume. We were fortunate to examine it in person. The jacket is an excellent case study of repair techniques over time. Caring for Textiles examined this jacket in 2016. We were able to take microscopic photos of many of the damaged burnout areas so we could understand the edges close up. This jacket is made from a really lovely lightweight cotton with a striped and floral printed motif. It is lined with linen. Here is some, a really good image of the type of burnout damage up close. On the left, you can see individual threads and their breaking points. On the right, you can see an area in the brown printed motif where it is completely lost. More good examples of the burnout on the left is an area where the brown is actively degrading. There's possibility of full loss in the future. And on the right, you see a small hole that has developed from the brown. With the jacket, we noticed two very different repair techniques as a historical representation of conservation and repair techniques over time. On the right, you can see that darning has been used. And on the, uh, on the left, you can see that darning has been used. And on the right, you can see the technique of netting encapsulation. This treatment was done by an unknown conservator, not caring for textiles, but it was very interesting to see these techniques side by side on the same garment. It was a veritable feast of previous repairs. Many campaigns, darning, netting, and other types of stitch repair over possibly 100 years, quite a visual glossary, some so lightly and lovingly stitched and strong and still survive. In a way, these previous darning repairs are a testament to women's skills and how we study and chronicle and learn from our predecessors. It makes us think about methods and appreciation for repair and fill then and now. The darning repair remains strong and protective. Another example, close up of the darning and the net. So I wanted to also address the future of printed textile conservation. Most of what we address today in these treatments were done with hand stitching and just to stabilize, but there are many methods of um, research being done to develop further and better um, methods to possibly halt and deacidify these textiles with their inherent vice. Um, in the future, we may have chemical processes available as treatment options um, to slow the textile degradation. Standard conservation methods such as encapsulation, darning, stitch repair, and painted infills, adhesive backings will still be employed, but options that change the chemistry of the fibers of the textile and slow down the degradation process may become much more viable options. In the world of paper conservation, where iron gall ink has caused similar burnout damages, an aqueous treatment is often used with great success to slow the rate of degradation. Since this treatment requires water, it is unsuitable for those textiles with weakened fibers and issues with dye fastness, which is a an issue for many of these printed textiles, such as the John Hewson one, which we decided was not suitable for wet cleaning. Dr. Helen Wilson, who now works as a conservator at the National Archives in England, 
completed her dissertation in 2012 doing research on non-aqueous conservation treatments for textiles testing positive for iron tannate dyes. Her research found several promising solutions, but no conclusive results. Some of the issues being further research is needed in the application process. After conversing with Dr. Wilson over email in 2017 before this presentation, she explained that she's not undergone any further research since the conclusion of her dissertation and no other conclusions have been made, but she believes her research has great, laid great foundation and she would be thrilled for others to take her findings further. Since this presentation, at Williamsburg in 2017, I've learned that Nicoletta Palladino completed her master's thesis, Nanomaterials for the Consolidation of Iron Tanny Dyed Textiles at the Polytechnic University of Milan in 2019. Her research builds upon the findings of Dr. Helen Wilson, and Dr. Helen Wilson aided in her research. As part of her thesis, Palladino uses calcium carbonate nanoparticles to neutralize the acidity, while the stabilization was addressed by a combination of nanocellulose and silica nanoparticles to truly tackle the complexity of uh, the nature of cotton textiles. You can find both of these dissertations online and read them for yourself if you are interested in learning more about these. They are very interesting. It is exciting for me to see that Dr. Wilson's research is being built upon. And if anyone out there listening to this talk today is interested in this research, it is very open for more findings to be discovered. Um, bibliography. And I want to thank you all again for having me and thank you, Padma. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, that was a very brief presentation. I think some people have just joined in. So um, any questions? Okay, there's one question about the use of gels to remove uh, acidity locally. Have you tried any use of gels? I have not, but I would be very interested to try that. I think that's a really good other um, re option to research and look into more. I, I know obviously it, it's a much more controlled way of doing that as far as trying to pull some of the acidity out. I've not done that personally myself, but I think that's a really great option. So I have a question. What is the normal uh, cleaning protocol? If you could just explain stepwise, how would you deal with a, a sub burnout? Just work to do with it. At least in all of these situations and my experience here in the studio, I have not personally wet cleaned any of these. So I don't know that I could personally speak to that. You have not attempted wet cleaning. If you could put the bibliography slide again, there's a request. Yeah, thank you. The next question is about using adhesives. I mean, a lot of questions about treatment of burnouts. Uh, have you used adhesives around the burnout areas for additional support? If yes, what is the most successful adhesive that you've used? I think you need to unmute yourself. There we, yep, there we go. Um, Usually, when in the past, when I've used adhesives, we typically use um, Glasgow treated um, fabric of our choice. Okay, Glasgow. Um, any other questions? I'm sorry, I think that was a very, very brief presentation. I think people are just <laughs> joining in. So uh, people are still understanding. If you can type in the questions on treatment of burnout, I think the question uh, is about the treatment protocol. So if you could just 
request Julia to join and maybe she could explain some of her experiences. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. she can. Of what? Treatment. Treatment protocol for, for which? Well, uh, yeah, Julia, I mean, present, uh, we were just wondering what is, uh, both are, the wet, are there any wet treatment options? The question was also about gels. Have you tried any gel treatments for uh, treating burnout print textiles? What is the we, protocol? We have not used any gel treatments. Okay. Um, we don't. Personally, I have not been trained in that and I don't have any experience. So that is not, uh, that's not a technology that is in my wheelhouse. Um, I suspect it's something that Caitlin is going to learn down the road. Um, it's becoming more prevalent uh, in treatments. However, in terms of the protocol for dealing with the, those um, textiles that have burn out and have, basically it's corrosion, isn't it? It's corrosion of fabric due to um, a metal mordant in the fabric. And so it just kind of eats at the fabric. So the only thing we can do is try to, if possible, if it's safe enough, wet clean the textile in order to try and um, neutralize the acidity in the textile, which will overall help the health of the textile. But in all of the cases, all of the examples that we showed in this lecture, all of them were too fragile to wet clean. And there was not enough reason to try and wet clean them that would outweigh um, the damages that could occur from wet cleaning. So we did not take that route. So therefore, um, our treatment protocols were simply, you know, analysis, really good documentation, surface cleaning, and then um, using stitch methods primarily, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't show any um, mm -hmm. other types of treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, using stitch methods and both um, patch supports and with fine stitching and then also overlays with fine netting, um, just to stabilize those weak areas. Um, so in the future, because, because these couldn't be wet cleaned, when further research has been done and we have really sound and tested non-aqueous cleaning methods that work on these, of course um, they would be employed and we would hope that and, you know, in the future something um, is discovered and it's a treatment that conservator, textile conservators all over use on printed textiles that can't be wet cleaned. And I think the research that someone like Helen Wilson has been doing will serve um, to be very useful down the road. Now, how much of her work has been applied or tested, I really don't know. But, you know, neutralizing, somehow trying to neutralize and slow down the corrosion because it is an inherent vice. So ideally, you know, the, the purpose of the treatment shouldn't be to continue to have to band-aid what's going wrong and degrading would be to try and neutralize and stop the degradation from occurring at all. But right now we can only do that through the methods of better storage, you know, good archival materials being near it and minimizing, you know, the chances of accelerated deterioration and corrosion. Obviously we know high humidity and high temperature dampness is going to accelerate that process. So, you know, good framing um, and good storage um, methods are going to help extend the life of the object in a passive way. Um, they have, you know, lived quite a long time. Several of those textiles are from the 1700s and they're, they're very carefully cared for. They are in, most of them are in archival storage. I don't know about the large Kalamkari, because it, it's a private collection, so it's actually framed and on somebody's wall. Um, but, you know, by and large, uh, textiles with this, of this era are in museums are kept in pretty careful, careful um, and protective storage. But 
I think it's an area that really warrants more research and more investigation. It's the kind of thing I hope that would be conducted in some of the graduate programs because I, it certainly has huge use and applicability in India, for example, where there are so many um, beautiful printed block printed textiles. textiles. There are huge collections, obviously, at the VNA and the Royal Ontario and all over the world. So I think that it would, you know, up until now, basically, um, people have just simply had to, you know, put a very fine supportive lining behind a very split and damaged and burned out cloth um, in order to just be able to handle it. So I'm afraid it's not a very optimistic answer there. <laughs> Thank you. The next more research, more research. Yeah, yeah, of course. I think it opens up a lot of questions. Sometimes it's good to open questions out. So the next question is, how is the presence of iron tenate detected? How do you determine that the burnout is because of the modern? So how do you detect the presence of iron tenate? Is there any way of detecting it? Um, I am unfamiliar with the testing, but I know, I think there's test kits you can buy from um, conservation websites that might, that would work for textiles that um, paper conservators also use to test for iron gall ink. Okay, right. We didn't actually, we didn't test them per se. Um, we had documentation from the museums and the people who own these pieces, and some of them had done analysis. Um, so, and then we know the historical context, and if we know the historical context, we know that there's a very good likelihood um, that that natural dye would have been augmented with an iron mordant because it was so common in order to get a saturated dark color. So a lot of that is just simply um, historical context rather than um, a physical test or analysis. But it can be tested because dyes can be tested. But um, testing of dyes is, is uh, complicated and you need a uh, good testing. It's not that it's highly sophisticated, but you need um, good comparisons. You need a really good set of comparisons. So when you're analyzing dyes, it's not gonna tell you very much until you can compare it to um, uh, a, set, a set of known dyes for comparison. So I know that when I did um, dye analysis back in the 1980s on a project, um, I did it with a very famous um, chemist from Germany named Helmut Schweppe, and he's published extensively. He's now gone to heaven, but he worked for Siba Geige for probably 60 years, and he was an extraordinary chemist. So he did a series of workshops in Washington, D.C. through the Smithsonian. Many of us participated in that doing dye analysis, and dye analysis of really old textiles, um, 16th, 17th, 18th century textiles. And one of the projects was to look at Southeast Asian textiles and analyze the dyes and see how, how early or how frequent the use of aniline dyes were popping up. Um, and we found that it was primarily for things like a bright pink or a purple, which the dyers were getting their hands on early, maybe in the 19, 1880s, even as early as the 1880s, and using these selective aniline dyes to just augment and pop a color. Um, but during that process of doing the workshops with Helmut Schweppe, we identified a lot of dyes with iron mordants in it, and all kinds of iron mordants. Um, so not just a bucket of nails, but various different metals were used. So um, if people want to look up his uh, publications, there are many. Helmut Schweppe, S-C-H-W-E-P-P-E. -E. Thank you, Julia. The next yeah. is, uh, 
what are the usual deacidification treatments uh, used for removing acidity from such textiles if deacidification is deacidification also possible without wet treatment and remove acidity in some form without wetting the fabric I think that's where a lot of the research is being done by Helen Wilson. Um, and she has looked into um, non aqueous cleaning methods. So for that, I would, if you're interested in reading and learning more about what she did and what she came up with for her non aqueous method, I would look into that one. Right. There isn't really another way. We don't have another way to deacidify. I mean, without we can. Using. We can, you know, put it with a buffered piece of tissue for a while and maybe hope that there's some transfer of, of acidity into the buffered tissue, for example. That's a passive treatment, and paper conservators will often use, use that same method. Um, but without wet cleaning, there's no way to neutralize, neutralize the acids. Next question is, how do you flatten areas with damages uh, before strengthening them or stabilizing them? How do you flatten them? What are the met methods to use? So that we, always, we, we always start very passively first. Um, so we might employ a passive humidification treatment, building a chamber and slowly introducing meth, um, um, moisture while we um, use weights to flatten it. And typically, in our experience, that seems to work very well. A little bit of moisture, and then a piece of mylar and some weights, and then checking and assessing, and weighting it and, and pressing it that way. Those textiles are so fragile that we would never put an iron on it, because the, iron, the heat of the iron could literally just, you know, damage the structure of the fiber. Um, so the heat would not be advisable at all. So we just, it's very passive. It's, you know, waiting and pressing and some humidification. Okay, thank you. Next question is, uh, of course, the effect of acid treatment does have, um, this acid treatment does have effect on fabric tensile strength. So any comments on that? Uh, how do you think the modern treatment, the, of course the printer, the burnout on printed textiles, uh, the effect of this process of printing on the fabric tensile strength, if you can comment on that. I think it definitely makes them more weak overall. That's another issue with um, their degradation over the t over time. It it weakens the cellulose uh, fibers. Okay. Uh, the next question is uh, is about the wet treatment. Is it what damage have what damage have you actually come across on any wet clean textile? Uh, just to illustrate probably for everyone, I'm probably saying so that we know why not to wet clean textiles. So what all possibly could go wrong when you wet clean a textile? Why do we not, why you are not advocating that at all? You could just stress on that a little bit more. First and foremost, we always test the dyes for color fastness. And in, in the case of the John Hewson textile, the dyes had a great potential to bleed when wet clean. So that was automatically eliminated. And sometimes they're on a, they're really just too brittle, even at the touch without even doing so much scientific analysis. You just can tell by feel that the textile is going to practically fall apart in water. Right, the surface tension. Mm -hmm. It's another consideration. It's not just the, the dyes bleeding, but you know the surface tension of the water can actually just snap the fibers. So there is a fine line between a textile that is very acidic and brittle and actually would be enhanced with um, a wet cleaning and neutralization of pH. However, it's not strong enough to endure it. So it's kind of just like a patient. You have to evaluate the patient. Are they going to survive the surgery? 
we know that a new heart valve will definitely help them, but are they in strong enough, have a strong enough constitution to actually sustain that kind of invasive surgery? So that's a matter of judgment and um, intuition, a little intuition bit too, yeah. and long time evaluating um, and knowledge of textiles. I. Um, as Caitlin says, intuition, it sounds kind of non-scientific, but, but after years of experience, you really need to trust your intuition. And as conservators, we tend to go on the more conservative end of things and not just get out the washing buckets at every, you know, at every uh, opportunity. So other things that can happen to a textile when it's wet cleaned is that when it's wet, the weight of it is so heavy that any weakened areas can easily rip and tear, and you can have fibers floating off and, lo and lost. Um, so surface tension, the fibers will swell, and in some cases, um, if it hasn't been tested or it wasn't realized that perhaps it's jute or it's a fiber that's going to or metallic threads, for example, that are wrapped, they could start to unravel, they could swell up and unravel. Jute will swell up and it will not regain afterwards. So then you have, you've changed the entire chemical composition of the textile. So there's, you know, wet cleaning is, is irreversible and that's why we approach it so cautiously. Um, we're trained, you know, to kind of uh, clean our clothing every day. And yet, um, when it comes to textile conservation, we back off and say, how necessary is it? Um, so surface cleaning is the go-to method for cleaning and removal of dust and dirt and insects. And really only if it's deemed absolutely necessary for some reason. And the testing has been done to try and ascertain that it's safe to wet clean only then do we proceed with that. So, you know, there's, you can lose color, not just dye bleed, but literally the color of a printed textile can just float out in the water. Um, there's so many things that can go wrong with wet cleaning. Um, old repairs can bleed. So you think all of the, all of the fibers are stable, but you forgot to test and old repairs or you didn't see them in a tapestry because it was so dirty and then you realize oh the old repairs are actually performing totally different than the rest of the tapestry fibers so i think it's complicated um thank you so just we always say caution <laughs> yeah. thank you the next question is about what threads to use for darning weak printed textiles I know my thread of choice is um, Scala by Guterman, a polyester monofilament thread. I think it has a very good strength. I know a lot of other conservators like to also use hair silk because you can easily dye it to get an exact match to the textile you're working on. So I think either of those threads um, would be good to use. What do you like, Julia? Um, I like the Guterman Scala because it's a monofilament um, as well, and it's very fine and it's really not very visible. It's quite difficult to work with sometimes because it's hard to see. Um, we also work with some very fine, just cotton threads. Um, they're German. Um, they're like two over 280 in terms of fineness, but we can only get them in white cream and black. Um, so if that works, if those colors work for a textile, those are extremely fine. Um, I tend not to use any of the silk flosses. I, I don't think they're strong enough. Um, it's important that any kind of stitch work, it's not too strong, but in some cases I've seen these really, really fine silk threads used for repair and um, the repair just doesn't hold up. That threads just snap over a period of maybe five to 10 years. So it's a shame to go to all that trouble and then 
have the threads fail so quickly. Maybe after 50 or 100 years, that's fine, but you don't want your work to fail after five or 10. Yeah. Thank you. Um, again, uh, is there some relative damage? Uh, do some metal mordants have to uh, damage more intensively than others? Have you found a relation like a specific metal mordant causing more damage compared to some other metal mordant? Has there a study been done on these? I don't exactly know personally, but I do think iron tends to be one of the biggest metal culprits in this case. Alum. Alum, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, quite honestly, I think that, that natural dyers know more than we know. Yeah. Uh, the people that are working with natural dye and using these iron mordants every day and they Not know anymore. so much about the, the mordants and the different iron mordants, different metal mordants. And I, you know, that there's a wealth of natural dyers in India and all over South and Southeast Asia. And there's a lot of data printed. Um, I know that it's very useful to, to work with natural dyers, to learn that whole you know, the whole knowledge of natural dyeing, because that helps inform, you know, knowledge about traditional textiles, particularly ones that were dyed and printed and um, with natural dyes and iron mordants. Thank you. The next question is, do you know if chelating agents have been tested to help with the damage from metal ions in the dyes? Chelating, chelating, uh, C-H-E-L-A-T-I-N-G. Agent being tested? Um, I personally am not familiar with that. Any research that you're familiar with in this field? Control the metal ions and the dyes? Stabilize them if they've used any? We have not. Um, and we haven't done any research on that. Okay. Thank you. The next question is textiles weighted with metallic salts. Uh, do the textiles weighted with metallic salts also suffer damage similarly? And can they also be treated in similar ways? Um, I'm not sure exactly. I think there is some burnout. And as far as stabilization goes, the same stitching and overlay techniques, all those methods can definitely be employed. Um, the weighted silks, which is the salt weighted silks, they are very problematic because they shatter. Um, and in many cases, uh, whether it's a morning picture or um, a ball gown or something, we can, we can tell when it's a weighted silk. And quite frankly, they're very problematic to work on. Um, and while sometimes we can use the methods that Caitlin mentioned, sometimes we can't even put a needle into them. Without them breaking yeah. and turning to powder, almost. So in some of those cases, we do have to employ um, um, adhesive. adhesive treatments. And or, you know, we work with other conservators, for example, you know, on painted textiles and, and um, multimedia textiles, we often will collaborate with the paintings conservator and other conservators to do treatments together. Um, so, but definitely many of those shattered silks have to be treated with, um, with um, adhesive because there's no way to stitch into them. Okay, thank you. The other question is, do you think there could be other factors to play in this bug feature, in this burnout, which we see, rather other than the formation of iron tenate? Because we know that tannins for iron gall is for gall extracts, while example, kalamkari, it's the myrobalan and the tannins from myrobalan are that proof, that have proven to be least corrosive, to produce least corrosive blacks. So do you see any other factors apart from the, the tannins that could actually cause the burnout? Have you any research supporting that? That's the question. I have not. Um, most of the research that I've seen on um, 
the burnout has to do with the iron tannate causing it. So that is interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I want to learn more about that. Interesting to know that that's used because it's um, the least likely to do that. So inter yeah. very interesting. Okay, thank you. I guess next question is, which dyes have been used by you for dyeing this color threads? Uh, what dyes do you use for dyeing threads? Um, Scala threads actually come in a, a wide variety of colors and um, for the most part there, there's enough available that you're able to get a very good match. I don't typically use um, silk threads but um, I know people uh, use acid dyes to, to get color match silk threads to stitch with. Yeah. There is so much conservation material out there about suitable and appropriate dyeing methods. Um, there's a wealth of data on, um, on dyeing threads for tapestry work and um, our colleagues in the UK and Scotland and even the Metropolitan Museum of Art have spent decades um, doing dye analysis and, and dyeing, custom dyeing of their threads and materials for you know, monumental tapestry projects that take decades. So I would defer to that. It's not an area that we specialize in and don't really have to dive into very deeply um, because of the nature of a private practice. But you don't dye your uh, supports or inserts. Do you do dyeing in your studio ever? And if you do, what do you use? On a minimal scale, when, yes, on a minimal scale, um, but not the threads. We use usually the Scala Guterman threads that are stable and come in a many different colors. Um, and if we need, in particular, a small a piece of fabric, um, we can dye it. What do you use for dyeing in the studio? We use the acid dye and um, I guess the, what's the other dye we've used? Right. No. Mm -hmm. mm. Jacquard makes it. I don't know. Yeah. We don't dye that frequently, but we don't use natural dyes. We use chemical dyes. Okay. Yeah. Depends on what you're dyeing. Yeah. How do you approach the loss in the fabric? Um, some of the printed, uh, the burnout leaves a loss. So is it left as it is, or do you put an insert? How do you approach the loss in the fabric? So in that case, we often have to refer to the client or the museum and the stakeholders because it becomes an aesthetic decision whether you see that loss visibly or you make it more invisible and represent the colors that are lost. No matter what, you're putting, if you're putting a fabric behind it and you're stitching around the edges, you're stabilizing it. So the conservator themselves doesn't necessarily have to be the one to make the decision of the color, more the curators and people involved with the museum are the ones who um, make the decision because it changes the look of the textile depending on what method you go to. So, and what factors affect your choice of overlay materials for a particular treatment, whether to use crippling polyester or nylon netting? I mean, when would you use crepling as an overlay and when would you use netting, nylon netting as an overlay? Um, personally, some of that choice for me comes with the open structure of the netting versus the um, less open structure of crepling. If a textile kind of seems to be very powdery, I wouldn't necessarily go with the netting because it allows for more of the, the powder to be released, but the crepeline seems to be a little more overly protected um, from that happening. But also um, the netting, I think, allows for more visibility of the textile beneath. Um, we use that a lot in these printed textiles because they weren't necessarily powdering. So we, we could use that to allow for more visibility of the beautiful prints beneath. I think in this case, a crepeline would, you know, kind of mute the design. And, and since it could use netting, we went with that. Yeah, it's, I mean, 
again, it's, you know, there's no one, one, one material works for one type of textile. It, it's just, it's so unique for each textile and each treatment. And so having a range of materials that you can assess and compare um, and experiment with is really important. And you build a kind of not only theoretical knowledge, but the hand skill, the sensitivity to each of those materials, because there's no kind of chart or grid that says, if you're treating Kalam Kari, then you use this and this and this. It just doesn't exist. It, there are too many forks in the road and too many um, minute decisions based on really careful assessment and analysis of the textile. And we're always looking for new fabrics and new fabric innovations. I know for a long time there was um, a synthetic material called stable text that was very widely used um, in textile conservation. You could um, heat set and cut the edges. It had many good uses comparable to silk crepe lean, but synthetic. And unfortunately, it's no longer manufactured. So, you know, textile um, materials come and go, and it's always important to research and know what materials are out there. You can um, look to many other industries that textiles are de being developed in um, that can be applied to textile conservation. It's a good argument for working with local mills and manufacturers and hand weavers, you know, if, if what's needed is a really, really fine, fine silk to be used as a support or as an overlay, um, you know, you have the capability to work with local weavers to try and produce something. I know this is being done in Japan, for example. They're looking at traditional methods of weaving and traditional cloths that were used for repair and they're trying to replicate them. So I think that um, that's also another direction that you can, you can investigate locally. Yeah, thank you. Now the question coming back to the inserts is, for the sake of the fabric, what would you recommend? Introducing an insert or not introducing an insert? Uh, can you repeat the last part? Said in the, the question of inserts, the losses, the treatment of losses, uh, to approach the losses, um, for the sake of interest of the fabric, would you leave the losses as such or would you go for something like inserts or patch bending? What would you recommend for, for the, from the fabric point of view? Oh, I think um, for areas of loss, a support would most likely be necessary more so I think what I was meaning is the color of the support whether the color mimics the area of you know the burnout loss if you have an area of black that is missing do you fill that do you make that patch support black to fill in that loss or do you do uh, a cream colored neutral backing so you you still see and understand where the loss of that material is um, but i think an area of loss at least in in my mind what i think um the question might be asking about it would need some sort of support okay so the weak edges uh, just treating the weak edges sometimes may be a good option yeah Okay, one more question. Have you come across any plant-based cleaning agents and overlay material other than nylon and polyester? Any natural uh, plant-based cleaning agent and overlay material? That's a good question for Julia. Plant-based um, cleaning and what else? Uh, overlay material. Cleaning. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, yeah, These all these lectures are separate and standalone, but I did mention that in the introduction to textile conservation the other day, which is that I've been working on a multi-nation Southeast Asian research project to examine and document and collect examples of traditional methods for the cleaning, stain removal, care, um, insect remediation, and also the, um, the spiritual associations and stories that go with the traditional methods of caring for textiles. And 
probably the largest group of natural cleaners is saponin. Um, and the saponin family is enormous. Often it's in the family of the acacia, but it's, it's a huge family of natural cleaners, some of them more effective than others. And we did do some testing comparing four or five different natural saponin, including, um, oh, one from Vietnam and two from Thailand and one from Indonesia, including Merak or soap nut, um, which is probably the most prevalent and the one people know uh, quite a lot about. In fact, it's, it's still used um, by almost all of the collectors and um, older women in Indonesia, particularly in Java, who wash their own batik, kain panjang, batik cloths on cotton, they always use lerak. Um, and we tested it and we found that it's as effective, if not better, at removing soiling um, and cleaning. And it has a relatively neutral pH and it's, you know, surpassed the performance of some of the um, chemical cleaners that we've all been using and trained to use um, over these past years. So I think there's a lot of work to be done um, on looking at traditional methods. And India has scores and scores of traditional methods that have been used for cleaning and for stain removal and for insect mitigation. Um, neem is a really good example of of uh, um, a plant that's used commonly to try and, you know, repel insects passively. Um, so, you know, the, the cosmetic industry is way ahead of us. They have already really mined a lot of these resources and they've published extensively and they're making a lot of money off of this. Um, the other thing is that there are a lot of younger, I'll call them millennials, but um, they're young um, people who are interested in kind of returning to some of the more natural products. And I've, I have observed throughout Southeast Asia in the last five to 10 years, a lot of handmade soaps and creams and products that are made using local plants um, on a DIY, very small manufacturing level. And so there's that movement there that goes hand in hand with cooking and people being interested in local organic food. So I think there's a lot to be done to investigate natural cleaners and they're better for our environment and they're better for our planet. So it would be great if people got involved. Now our, our project is going to be published it, um, it's going to be a, a book. We had 14 researchers and representing all of the countries in the ASEAN um, group. And this was supported through some education, Department of Education funding of ASEAN. Um, so I'm hoping it'll be published this, this coming fall, winter. And if so, I can alert people about that. Um, nice. and, but I'm not sure of the public. It's way behind schedule. So a little, we're disappointed, but we're hoping finally, finally it will be published. So, thank you. And uh, regarding any plant-based natural overlay material other than nylon or polyester, any other options except nylon or polyester? Um, that's usually the material. Cotton, silk. Yeah, uh, that's usually the material that the netting that we find pro product-wise is is made from. There is cotton netting, though usually it's very thick and doesn't allow for so much transparency. But yes, cotton and silk are options. Um, if you're doing overlays. Uh, you often want to see the textile beneath, so transparency is important. So if, if you were looking at other um, non-synthetic materials, we kind of talked about silk crepeline could uh, possibly be a good option since it is pretty transparent. And silk net is available. It does not happen to be very strong. So not, yeah, not as strong as the um, synthetic nets. Right. Okay. Option. I think uh, that's all for the questions. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you, Caitlin. I think we had, Thank you. I think we shared a lot of information. It was very useful. Thank you for your time.
Thank you hey. for joining us, and uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll meet again. Maybe. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you for joining.